<laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to find out from you when the moment was that you realized you were going to be a chef and how old you were when that moment of realization arrived. I was always going to be a chef since I was a kid. I, I guess at six years old, I remember baking my birthday cake. I could make rock buns at that time. I could make shortbread at that time. No recipe, no scales, no anything. I could make them perfect every time. So really, I was always going to be a chef from six years old, I reckon. And you can bake at six. Baking I can bake. so hard. I could bake at six, and my next door neighbour was a hopeless cook, and she would come round with a disaster, and at six or seven years old, I could give her advice of what she's done wrong with a sponge cake or a butter cake or whatever. That's amazing. Have you ever had a disaster? I've had my fair share of disasters for sure, you know. It's sort of, when you, you're cooking professionally, you know, that you're, you're always pushing the limits of produ production and how many things you've got going on the go. So there's always going to be something along the way that's a disaster. Once I, I put a, a pot of a bechamel sauce in the oven, that you're supposed to cook a bechamel really in the oven for like two hours to get the flour really cooked out. But we in fact forgot about it, went on a three day break, came back and the pot had totally collapsed and the pot had melted. So that was the worst <laughs> thing I'd ever burnt. It was in the oven for three days. <laughs> okay, well that's kind of normal. One knife, one knife for the rest of your life. Only one knife, one shape. Which, which one Look, would it be? I'm, I'm a traditionalist when it comes to chef's knives. I like the classic sort of style of chef's knife with a good heavy handle. I'm not really into the modern um, straight cut ones like the sort of the, the chrome looking ones, they, they don't have enough weight for me. There's a Japanese knife that I've got at home, I think it's called a RAN, R-A-N knife, which is the layered sort of samurai sword. That's beautiful, costs sort of $400. Oh my goodness. And is a beautiful knife, so it would have to be that one. I'd have to use one of those Japanese folded sort of okay. blade sort of knives. If, um, if you were gonna go away with two friends, yeah. who would you choose? Chefs? Yeah, chefs. I'd go with my mates, you know. I'd go with Matt Moran and Darren Simpson, you know. I'd go with Darren because he'd know where all the KFCs are. <laughs> That's not and, funny. And <laughs> uh, no, I would go with Darren because Darren is one of the most talented chefs in the country and probably one of the most fun guys to be around with. You know, he's really, he loves cooking, he loves sharing a table and he's a great guy to be around. And Matt's my best mate and, you know, we just take the piss out of each other. So. If given that you have you know such great friends, and I know you've got you come from the UK and you have some amazing friends over there, yeah. Who would you say is the Australian chef that inspires you the most? The best chef Australia's ever produced is David Thompson. Okay. Um, I think he's gone on to be successful internationally. He's a he's a true original and he's really an articulate man that studied a style of cuisine and is a master of it. International chef. International chef David Thompson could fit quite into that, which is sort of funny because I'm not really big on Thai food, really. I don't really cook a lot of Asian <laughs> food. But look, Gordon Ramsay is a good mate of mine, and whilst Gordon sort of polarises people, without a doubt, he um, he's shown the potential of what a chef can achieve. You know, so it would have to be my vote would have to go to him. He did sort of start the whole process, didn't he? I mean, he took the chef out of the kitchen and put them into a place that is just you know, Stella changed the whole food world, really. Look, he, he, Gordon is a corporation and an international corporation. And when you look at um, a lot of young chefs nowadays, they, they're quick to judge him. They're quick to judge him, but very slow to understand really where he came from. And, you know, they can judge him for as he is on TV. But if you know Gordon like I do, I, I met Gordon when he was a, a second commie baker at the Gavroche in London, right? He did that job for six months. You start work at 10 o'clock at night, six nights a week. You finish at five o'clock in the morning. You make all the bread for three, Mich three, three Michelin starred restaurants right that bread has to be perfect and that is a shit job by any stretch of the imagination while everyone else is out going out for dinner having a drink gordon's there rolling bread proving bread breaking it in the oven he's got talent in his hands and you don't get to you don't get to the top of cooking without being able to do it there's no shortcuts no that's absolutely true what is the one produce that you find you cook with more than anything else in your kitchen in the kitchen here as opposed to the kitchen at home in, in this kitchen, we use Mediterranean, we cook a sort of modern Mediterranean food. That's where all our influences are from. So things like olive oil, Parmesan cheese, parsley, capers, chili, onions, garlic, all of those things are, are, produ are, are products that we use all the time. To tie it down to one thing is pretty much impossible. You know, our, 
we, we, buy, we buy a lot of meat and a lot of seafood here, so we use a wide range of, of all different produce all the time. And if I were to ask you, I mean, I love Summit. Summit has always been one of my favourite restaurants, and we're sitting here with this incredible view. It's just it's stuck sexy. on the window, really. <laughs> we can change it. That. We change we it. Sometimes we put like a desert scene up there, and herds of wildebeest <laughs> floating majestically across the. You I know. can deal with the Africa side of it. But, okay, if you're not going to eat here, which is a really gorgeous restaurant, where would the most romantic restaurant in Sydney be for you? I mean, where would you take your wife? Oh, look, if, if it's romance, it's room service somewhere. Um, Good but answer. if it's uh, you know if it's uh, <laughs> if, if it's a restaurant really you just want somewhere sort of moody and sort of quality you know like for me I think Pendolino sort of fits that in I if you can get a table Pendolino. in the corner you know I think even Spice Temple you can sort of skulk around there without anyone seeing you know that's really what I've sort of up to <laughs> skulking yeah <laughs> so then if I'm going to ask you okay room service the sexiest produce I mean you want to get you know you you, you want to get I don't know. Like, I, th I think all going. food of quality is, you know, sort of can be sexy in its own way. And like, you know, a drizzle of vinaigrette on a plate can look as good as an amazing, you know, Peter Gilmore snow egg or whatever. It, everything can have its own element of beauty. But if you're looking at something that's sexy, really, it, probably chocolate is probably the, the one that fills the fills the gap the most. Are you allowed to eat chocolate? I'm diabetic. I eat dark chocolate. I don't okay. eat white chocolate or milk chocolate. Occasionally stick my finger in as I walk past when we're making truffles, but um, really, no, I don't eat a lot of chocolate. I just tend to, tend to steer away from it. So if I was to say to you, you're only allowed to ever eat one protein for the rest of your life, what would you choose? Fish, meat, poultry, or piggy? I'd be seafood, definitely. Would you be a seafood Probably be person? tuna, I think. Okay, tuna for the rest of your life. That would be pretty good, I think. Yeah. Any particular way that you'd like to do it? I mean, do you have a favorite seasonal recipe for home? For tuna, look, obviously like we all like to eat tuna, sort of like, well maybe not everyone, but I like to eat it raw, like sashimi or carpaccio or something like that. But I also love to confit just a block of tuna, that sort of slow poach it in olive oil. So I might put it into a ceramic pot with some whole garlic and shallots, sprig of thyme and parsley, a couple of chilies, and I'll warm that oil and then I'll just pepper and season a piece of tuna and drop it into that warm oil, put it in the oven and cook it for maybe 25 minutes. So it's still only just cooked and allow that to cool. Flake that onto mm -hmm. a salad, mix it up with some mayonnaise as a, as a sandwich mix, flake it onto a, a pizza. You can eat it any different way you like, but it's delicious. Your beautiful book, Blood Sugar, that you have out, which is just selling amazingly yeah. well, that is a, a testament to the fact that you are diabetic and that you have actually had some really hard health issues mm. in the last year or two. I mean, how have you kind of overcome that? Because as I was saying recently, I think you're looking really good. I was telling Sean Connolly you were looking really good and he was like going, Because he's looking really? fat now, isn't he, is Sean? He? Since he's on travelling business class all the time. <laughs> is that what it is? Every time he gets on the plane, he puts on <laughs> half a kilo, Sean. So, you know, I mean, the, the story, the journey that has come to, I mean, as a chef initially, it's very hard to say that there's something that you can't eat or something that you can't cook because it's your world. Yeah, look, I think that you don't have to eat everything you cook, but certainly blood sugar came around from sort of the, the greatest moment of adversity in my life. It was a low point, I had a stroke, I'd been suffering from diabetes, things were pretty bad. But at that moment in time, I decided to get up and walk forward and to take positive steps. And that sort of got me where I am in my life, is I'm sort of relentless in my process of moving forward and, and facing challenges. So Blood Sugar was written to inspire people to eat well and cook well, um, to enjoy food and realize that just because you've got certain health limitations, you don't have to go without or live in a gastronomic wilderness. And olive oil, olive oil, a different olive oil to dress the salad and to cook with, or the same one, or not that much olive oil? No, I don't really, really like, cook, cooking with olive oil is a, is a, a load of sort of crap really. Oh, really. And it, once you've got the oil hot enough, to cook anything in it, you've destroyed all the characteristics of that oil. So if, if someone starts to say, if you read a recipe that says, take a good splash of extra virgin olive oil, you might as well just stop the recipe there and go to the next one. Because you can just use a pomace oil or a virgin oil or anything like that. There'll be a little bit of residual flavor, but the complexities of beautiful olive oils um, are totally lost through the heating process. Who's the most famous person you've ever cooked for? I cook for everyone. Where do you want to start? The Queen, Princess Diana, Madonna, Elton John, um, Dustin Hoffman, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Joan Collins, etc, etc, etc. The whole lot. And who did you love cooking for the most? 
Oh, look, I think um, it's hard, really. It's hard. My mum's my biggest VIP. If I could have anyone in the restaurant tonight, it'd be my mum. Really? That's amazing. Where does she live? She lives in the UK, and I don't see her very often. But, you know, like, the Queen is someone else's mum, and it's great. But really, <laughs> they should be cooking for her. You know, it's exactly. like... But, you know, you, you, celebrity's been a part of my, my whole working life. And really, when you meet the, the real A-list celebrities, the real big boys and girls, right... They're beautiful people that are really comfortable in their space and they know how to deal with people around them. You know, but when you meet the bees that think they're something or think they deserve to be something, they can be a real pain in the ass and not really nice people. So I don't sort of have a lot of time for the B graders, you know. Okay. You love to ride your motorbike. You have a motorbike. And I've noticed that quite a few of the chefs actually all have bikes. What is it about a motorbike that, you know, makes you feel good? I don't know, it's that old rock and roll, I reckon. All chefs think they're rock and roll stars, don't they? <laughs> James Dean or whatever they are. They all fancy themselves a bit. But um, look, I just love, like, I've ridden motorbikes since I was 15 years old. And I just, what I love most about riding a motorbike is that you smell everything. Oh. Right? If you're going to buy a house somewhere, you should get a motorbike and ride it around the house at different times of the day. And you'll hear, you'll smell, and you'll really absorb the environment that, that you're going to live in. And one thing that you think everyone should know about you? The one thing everyone should know about me? I never give up. Never underestimate me and I'll never give up. You can't, you can't put me down and keep me down. I will always come back fighting and that, that determination has taken me from the very start to where I, wherever I'm going to end up. So. Okay, so a little bit about your kitchen because we've spoken a little bit about you. What do you think is the hardest thing to cook? Well, I don't think anything's really hard to cook because I can do it. But if you can't cook, sugar's really hard to cook, seafood's really hard to cook. And the reason I say sugar is because sugar is a really powerful commodity. You, know, you make caramel sauces with it, you can, you can preserve things with sugar. Sugar is, is an amazing product and it's so overlooked. And if you learn the power of sugar and you learn to cook with it, you become really empowered. <laughs> And then seafood, seafood is, is ultimately very difficult to cook because it is perfect for, you know, seconds really. It is, it is cooked in its prime probably for five or six seconds. So if you can hit that target consistently, then you sort of, you know what you're doing. If we've had too much to drink and we're going for junk food, what's your choice? I know you're not allowed to eat that much junk food, so what junk food would you choose? Yeah, junk food. It depends how you package junk food. Like, you know, I love a doner kebab. You know, ah, but if you get a kebab. good kebab that's been grilled properly with a pit of bread and, and some salad and that in it, it actually can be quite a low GI, high protein snack, you know. So whilst it's junk food, you know, and you eat it when you've had a few drinks or whatever, I certainly like a kebab. I'm not a big pizza, pizza eater really. You know, burgers, not really into those, so I'd, I'd have to say a kebab. What would you say is your best food moment to date? What is the one thing that just makes you go, Look, for, wow. best Great food is, is a moment in time, you know. It's really like restaurants find it very hard to sell that and to package it. But for me, the best thing I've ever eaten was a sardine caught by a 75-year-old fisherman off the back of a boat on the Mediterranean in Turkey. He poured it on a bit of string, he pan-fried this thing, he chopped up a marmon tomato with parsley, crap olive oil, mixed it up, put it on top of the sardine and gave it to me. And it was the best thing I'd ever eaten in my life. So that's there's, a moment in time. You can't you. replicate that. And you'd have to say that Steve Manfredi's mum, Franca, her truffled gnocchi is, is still it just like all the tortelli she makes. She's just, any pasta with truffles that Franca cooked for me is just fantastic. Well, I've come to the end of all my beautiful questions and I just want to say thank you so much for sitting here with me and, and hanging out and being so generous you come on my radio show so often and i love having you around and you make me laugh and you your sean who's one of your best friends makes me laugh too and i think Fat sean he's great and you're great and so um, <laughs> i'm really grateful that you have taken the time to do this so thank you no it's no, no problem at all it's always a pleasure